All right, great. Uh, so our uh, final speaker of the session will be Sretan Turcic, uh, who is at the Institute of Field and Vegetable Crops at Novastad. Thank you for the announcement. I will try to describe what we have done in the past and what we are doing now in this presentation. So the subject, of course, are the plant pollinator interactions, which we uh, studied very much because we do uh, sunflower breeding, basically, but also do a lot of seed production in the fields, commercial seed production. So in front of a small group, but very motivated, and uh, our pollinator research center, uh, I will go a little into the history, back to 1962, when our industrial crops department was formed. And after some 15 years, our institute was among the first three countries in the world to introduce sunflower hybrids to mass production. Hybrids, of course, uh, as previous speakers uh, discussed, uh, initiated plenty of research about pollination and compatibility and fertility and other traits. Uh, we made a review that was published in the OCL Journal in 2017 about different studies we made. And early on in the 1979, we started with the effect of environment and then studied auto fertility, genotype effects. Back then, cultivars were still an option for uh, growers, so we compared cultivars and hybrids. Uh, one of our researchers also tried to use honeybees for pollination of wild sunflower species, as we have a large uh, wild species collection at Novi Sad. And as, uh, as was also mentioned, the fluorescence characteristics were recognized as important. So that coral length was, was also inspected, how it affects visitation. After the 2000, uh, we focused more on uh, some agricultural practices, for example, soil fertilization, but also nectar production, seed treatment with various insecticides, and sowing density, which is very important for optimal seed production. Uh, nowadays, we try to uh, uh, go a bit wider, uh, inspect different pollinator species, and we also not only work on sunflowers, we also try to use the experience we have on some other crops. So we all uh, 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 know that pollination of sunflower is uh, very important because especially in hybrid seed production, the reduction can be more than 90%, of course. And it is a result of three basics for plants, pollinators, and of course the environment in which all that is happening. So sunflower may be the most known heliotropic plant. It means that uh, photosynthesis is increased with the movement of not only sunflower head, but also leaves. And after the flowers are opened, the heads fixed to the east, which prevents excessive exposure to the sun and preserves the pollen that germinates on the stigma to allow fertilization. Drying of moisture is also important to reduce the risk of developing fungal infections. Uh, this is one interesting detail is about heat. If not too much, of course, as the first speaker mentioned, temperature helps uh, because on, uh, on the sunflower disc, temperature is a bit higher than air temperature, which uh, allows pollinators to spend more time and visit more frequently so that pollination eventually is more efficient. On the left, you can see a presentation of a sunflower head with uh, almost uh, complete uh, fertilization, completely set seeds in what we could uh, think of optimal daily averages. And on the right, what happens if the temperatures go above 30 degrees, which is not unusual in our uh, ex experimental fields, we monitor the even above 40 degrees. And when relative air humidity is also low, fertilization can be down up to 60%. With reduced bee activity, pollen viability, which shortens pollen transfer time, and which was also mentioned by one of the speakers, reduced compatibility of stigma and pollen. 
temperatures, temperatures are constantly increasing, unfortunately, with daily, monthly and yearly extremes recorded more frequently and almost all in the last decade. So, soil moisture is one of the basic parameters if you look at plant production, but uh, also how well that plant uh, can attract pollinators. Here we have a comparison of two very diverse years, year number one with almost optimal soil moisture and year number two with drought stress conditions. So in, in that trial, we compared the, the effect of genotypes. We had four hybrids, hybrid Vega, NSH45, NSH111, and NSH702 in three different fertilizer applications with 0, 50, and 100 kilograms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So when soil moisture is available, you can see that both the genotype effect is significant and the fertilizer application. But when moisture is not available, the genotype effect is almost not, not present and a very little of the fertilizer difference. Uh, we had a, I should say, a gray period in agriculture in Serbia in, in the period between 1994 and uh, some years after the year 2000, where the application of fertilizers was very low. Approximately a third of the fields were without any fertilizer application. And those that had fertilizer application were with very low quantities of each of the nutrients, almost 10 times lower. So why I am showing this to you? Because of the next slide, to be more clear, uh, these data are all found either in literature data, this one is for 1955, or our trials from our institute, or direct information from some senior honey beekeepers. So you can see all, also the change from open pollinated varieties over hybrids and the modern genotypes where the quantity of honey per hive in Serbia varied very, very, very much. And today, uh, after all the problems we had with agricultural practices, now we have climate change that is also affecting yield variations. And that is probably why we have such large variations in honeybee uh, yields, in honey yields per hive. So, uh, what about agricultural practices? How do they affect the plants and why are they important for the subject we are speaking about today? They are important because they should increase plant productivity and reduce the harmful effects of stress factors. The effect, of course, depends on the moment of occurrence, intensity and duration of the critical factor. And it is not only drought, there are other problems. So optimal measures are defined and we have recommendations for almost all regions where sunflower is grown. We know what are good or bad pre-crops and how and when to do plowing, fertilization, sowing and control of pests, disease and weeds. So uh, when we again look at the plant, it uh, changed very much in the, since the end of the 19th century. Back then we had uh, some, or in that period, we had some very productive open pollinated varieties. But if you compare those with modern hybrid, especially hybrid seed production fields, these look more like a factory than plant field. And the end result is that we have now more uniform flowering with shorter duration of flowering, cultivation on larger fields, much larger fields with less genotype variability, which all summarizes in uh, less time for honeybee foraging, which is why we also tend to have smaller honey yield per hive on plots. So uh, the golden question, how can sunflowers attract pollinators the best? So there are some factors, of course, color. Marco will speak tomorrow a very interesting subject about UV patterns in sunflower. There is the scent, which is probably the first that pollinators sense pollen and nectar quantity and quality. So by now we know that bees and plants 
talk to each other in a colorful language that people cannot see, hear, or feel, or it is a bit difficult without proper equipment. Uh, the visit is, as I said, influenced by the appearance and the color of flowers, as well as the aromatic composition of the fragrance. The scent originates from easily volatile compounds secreted by flowers, which insects can feel quite far away. And now a long time ago by a group of French authors, it was concluded that at the beginning of flowering, the scent is most attractive. And it has been found that the mother's lines attract bees more than the father's lines. Unfortunately, due to more complex analysis, the aromatic composition of the fragrance has been less studied, although it may be the first factor attracting the pollinator. Now about quantities, some flower, of course, produces a lot of pollen, and it is a major source of proteins, but also some amount of sugars. And the nectar varies very much, as presented in the previous presentation. In our trials, we concluded that it's about 0.2 to 1.6 milligrams per floret, which comes to 12 to 96 kilograms of nectar per hectare from the available flowers. Yeah. Uh, the sugar content, of course, can vary significantly in the total amount and probably uh, affects more visitation than the total amount of nectar. And, of course, the sugars, mainly glucose and fructose, but also sucrose is present and it is our assumption that sucrose may uh, be more influential about the visitation uh, or preference. Uh, this is again information from direct from a single honeybee keeper and information about yield per hive. Uh, so in a drought stress year, it's about 22 kilograms per hive and in an optimal moisture, about 60 kilograms. Uh, this is just to show uh, again what the speakers in, in previous presentation said, how different can uh, nectar production be between different genotypes. Here, there are 15 different genotypes. All of them were commercial hybrids cultivated widely in eight different environments of growing. So they are sorted based on the average nectar content. But even the, one of the most stable ones, NSH 111, had more than five times variability in nectar content in different environments, from three to more than 15 milligrams per 10 florets. So we are back to corolla length now. Uh, we found that inbred lines had larger variability for corolla length than the hybrids, but both almost less than 10 millimeters. And we found no significant correlation between corolla length and honeybee visitation. That may be due to the fact that floret lengths shorter than 10 millimeters should not restrict access as the depth is at 70% of floret, total floret length. So it's measured up to here with, before the uh, opening. So I'm repeating now this slide. I did not know it will be in the previous presentation. So if wild bees are discussed, then it is a much bigger problem because they are smaller by size and then uh, access can really be a problem. So in Serbia, we have mostly honeybees, followed by bumblebees, surfits, solitary bees, and butterflies. Uh, we made, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, many different trials. This is one of the, I think, more interesting ones. Uh, we took at that time some uh, hybrid combinations, RIMI, NSH 2023, and NSH 2026. And uh, put them in the field exactly as we usually do in the, some uh, first steps of uh, selection. So it is 400 plants per isolation cage. And for each hybrid combination, we've made three different sets. This one is a bit strange, but it was only made to assess attractivity of A and B lines, R and the hybrid. The second and the third are typical combinations for seed production, multiplication, sterile and maintainer, and sterile and restorer line. Now, what we compared, because usually uh, 
maybe not in every program, but uh, frequently field workers enter the cages and do pollination by hand. But that has a one disadvantage of a potential uh, unwanted uh, move of pollen from one cage to another. So we also tracked bumblebees, open pollination outside the cages where mostly honeybees were present and self-pollination. Uh, this is how the setup looked like with the commercially available uh, bumblebee hives and the uh, activity monitor with, with an infrared sensor. We checked pollen vitality with the staining method and nectar quantity with mic microcapillary method. The presence of pollinators was assessed at 10 inflorescences every two hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. with an additional observation at 8 a.m. for three consecutive days. Seed yield was measured at five inflorescences and this is what we found. So in the first column, it is description of genotypes. There are three groups for each hybrid combination, A and B lines, R line and the hybrid. And the following column contains information about the visitation. So this one is about mostly honeybees. They visited in each combination, mostly hybrids. Bumblebees on the other side visited mostly CMS lines and only the first combination, the second best was the CMS and uh, visited most the hybrid. But bumblebees on the other hand visited um, uh, the minimum number of bumblebees was on R lines in all three combinations. Now, when we go to the total seed production, yield preferences, open pollination and bumblebees were most efficient, while hand pollination was much less. And of course, selfing done with paper bags was the lowest. So the presence of pollen had a positive effect on bee visits and was not correlated with nectar secretion. Honeybees collected more pollen in this trial and bumblebees collected nectar. So the visit of pollinators was not significantly related to nectar content, but it may be the effect of variable quality in terms of sugar content and composition. So as I said, we do a lot of seed production on a large scale. And when we do some recommendations, uh, as was also commented, uh, it is sometimes a question of how far the, uh, can honeybees efficiently do pollination. So we have the recommendation of about 500 meters. It may also be more, but that is something that we found uh, recommendable. Two to three hives per hectare, and they should be brought at least three days before flowering for them to accommodate. And without bees, of course, the seed yield is much reduced. And again, the question of the uh, yields of honey, uh, it is over four, 40 kilograms per hive, not uh, uh, relatively frequently. Uh, CMS lines do not produce pollen, but again, the restorer line is branched and produces a lot of pollen, so that prolongs the foraging period. Uh, to answer some questions that could not be answered so clearly in the field, we also uh, evaluated some uh, lines and hybrids in controlled conditions and tried to answer some questions that were constantly asked about modern hybrids versus old cultivars. So we used same conditions for each plant and we found some uh, interesting things about, for example, decreasing the amount of nectar with flowery aging. So mostly between day one and two. And probably because of that, bees prefer to visit newly opened flowers that can also differ in light, in lighter color. So if you only talk about the content of nectar, uh, Peredovic as an open pollinated variety was comparable in nectar quantity with other modern hybrids. And again, less than some that were in the trial. And the field was uh, more appropriate for nectar production at least. Uh, how we configured the climate chamber. chamber. Uh, sowing density is uh, one of the basic recommendations in uh, sunflower grow growing. So mostly hybrids are grown at 60,000 plants per hectare. Confectionary sunflower in a bit less because of the larger uh, plant ca habitus. 
And here we see a small decrease in a single forehead mass and the fluorescence diameter. But again, if you look at the total quantity per hectare, it is obvious that the total nectar quantity is rising significantly. Uh, if you look at pollinator attractivity, we found something again interesting that at 60,000 plants per hectare, the attractivity increased, and, but that should be looked into a bit more to find out why, maybe because the plants were optimized for that density of growth. Uh, this is one nice example of how nectar quality can affect visitation. Here we had a uh, hybrid orphae with lowest quantity of nectar, but again with highest visitation rate. Insecticides are a constant uh, subject because they are very interesting to sunflower growers, but not so to honey beekeepers. And, uh, we try to assess how they affect bee visitation. So at that time, we took all the available uh, and allowed for use uh, insecticides on our market and uh, treated the seeds and grew them with the control without treatment and found that there was no significant difference in honeybee attractivity. Application of insecticides started in Serbia with Furada in 2000, Gautrend Cruiser in 2005, but not long after that, neonicotinoids as a group were banned since 2013, and at present, less than 5% of seeds are treated with any insecticide. Now, this is a very uh, nice trial that we did uh, to see how the pollinators can be used for some other uh, uses, not only pollination. So the idea was to use pollinators as vectors of bioagents to fight some diseases we have on sunflower. So Sclerocinia sclerociorum was chosen as one of the most harmful sunflower pathogens. And for the evaluation of bioagent efficiency uses using Clonostachys rosa as an antagonist. Uh, bumblebees were chosen as vectors of bioagents and that was placed in the, in the tray on the exit path from the hive. We used the commercially uh, available hybrid Oscar, uh, 200 plants per cage, of course, treatment cage, control cage with bumblebees, and control plots with non isolated plants, bumblebees, and bioagent. The hives were placed in the cages in the budding phase just before flowering. Uh, we, were, we were partly successful. We concluded that the method is applicable. Unfortunately, the years when we tested were also appropriate for uh, white mold uh, development. So we did not manage to stop it completely, to suppress it, but we did have higher seed yield and a lower disease incidence. So I mentioned our pollinator research center. Except for sunflower, we also worked a lot of, on rapeseed and alfalfa and about the target pollinator species, those are honeybees, bumblebees, osmia species, and megaphili. And we focus on caged pollinators trial because it is the start of uh, each selection program when you need a lot of separate isolation plots and they are most easily made by using isolation cages. So we try to develop methods uh, how to increase seed production in such specific environments. We also use pollinators in wild species, and this is a presentation of that, and develop methods further for, pollinate, for cultivated sunflower. We try to collect naturally present populations, like in this setup for Megahila. Now, I will only use rapeseed as an example of how we approach the problem of adapting methods for controlled environments, semi-controlled. So we try to see whether the long-term population sustainability is possible in confined environments using a monolectic diet. And of course, to compare cost effectiveness between insects and people. Because of the period of flowering, we used Osmia species on rapeseed and adapted special bee nest design to protect bees from excessive heat and other. Uh, negative factors. We had a very good result, much, uni much more uniform and much more efficient uh, fertilization, which translated into 
almost three times higher seed yields with appropriate uh, number of pollinators in the cage, which is presented in the T numbers, 110, 220, and 340 for both species, Osmia cornuta and Rufa. And similar to sunflower, higher oil content you know, for about 2%. So to conclude, the main limiting factors for pollinator attractivity, activity are air temperature and water availability for plant development. Uh, of course, it's a long history of plant breeding, but we can say that variability is still available in nectar production and attractiveness to pollinators. Uh, the attractivity traits are, are already known and presented here in a few lectures, but unfortunately they are progressively more demanding for evaluation, but maybe they should be used at least for CMS lines. As abiotic and biotic stress becomes more pronounced, the development of agricultural practices and plant breeding can benefit from optimized plant pollinator interactions. So if you talk about future, we, tend, we plan to work on mason bee insecticide susceptibility in cages, honeybee pesticide trials, because that uh, field is constantly changing with new uh, treatments available, but in the start with unknown effect on pollinators. And of course, testing underutilized pollinator species. Thank you for your attention.